The work says that with certain efforts, we can develop and complete ourselves. Well, what this necessarily means is that we are not developed and we are not complete. If that's true, if we're undeveloped and incomplete, why is it that we can die just fine? And the answer to that is there are two different ways of looking at man. There's man as basically an animal. You understand that you are inhabiting an animal body. Your body shares all the same things that all the animals on this planet share. Now, there are some differences. You walk upright. You have the ability of speech and language in a way that seems to be higher than other animals. Although, it appears that there are other mammals who do have the ability of some kind of speech that we haven't learned quite yet. For instance, I think dolphins is an example. Whales is an example. Obviously, birds communicate. So there are animals that communicate. They all communicate in some way. We seem to have the ability, we have the ability to read and to write. We have the ability to make books and to leave records and to paint paintings. And other animals don't do that. So we're clearly a higher form of animal, but animal nonetheless, we still need to eat physical food, put physical food into our physical bodies in order to keep going, just like all the other animals. So in a sense, we are a species of animal. We inhabit the body of a species. When the work says, with certain efforts we can develop and complete ourselves, what it says is, there's nothing you really have to do very much of. Mostly you learn what you have to do to develop as a species. So as a human being, you're trained by your parents when you're young how to feed yourself, how to wash yourself, how to clothe yourself, how to do all of the things that you need to do. And then as it progresses, you go through your education and you acquire skills for being a good animal, a good social animal that fits in with the society of social animals of our species. Now, the problem that we have with this is it's not very flattering to us. It really offends our inflated sense of self, our egos, this pride and vanity that we are burdened with, thinking that, well, we're the crown of creation. We were created specifically individually by God, and so we're different, and we are different. But we share a lot of the same thing. The difference for us is that we can develop in a way that other animals cannot. And I don't mean just being able to use tools and read and write and paint. I mean that we can develop in a totally different direction that the other animals cannot. And this is what makes man, with a capital M in the work sense, different from animals. But he doesn't have to develop, and he will not develop automatically or mechanically. In order to develop in this way, you have to make effort. With these certain efforts, and the reason it says certain efforts is because there's no way I can tell you all of the efforts that you have to make right now. Just certain efforts. There are certain right efforts. There are things that you must do. If you want to learn how to write a language, there are certain things you must do. If you want to learn how to speak a language, there are certain things you must do. If you want to learn how to develop in this way, there are certain things you must do, certain efforts you must make. And then, and only then, can we complete ourselves. In other words, be all that it is possible for us to be. It's possible for us to be good animals, but it's possible for us to be more than animals, to be what the work calls a man. Beginning of all this, all this self-study, is the realization that we are mechanical. This is a very difficult thing for us to realize. We don't like to think of ourselves as mechanical, but we are inhabiting a species body, a species animal body that is indeed mechanical. How can you verify that? You cut yourself. What happens? And then what happens if you can stop the bleeding? Edema comes to the surface and it causes a scab and it goes on and on. And it's all mechanical. It can all be predicted. You can even predict healing times, approximately how long it will take based on age, based on diet, based on protection, based on a lot of different things, but you can predict, and pretty accurately, how long it's going to take. So that's why when they put you in a cast, if you break a bone, they put you in a cast, they say, well, it's going to take you this long. And then after that long, they'll check. And they'll say, okay, well, it's going to take you another week. Or it looks like the cast can come off now. It's fully healed. It's predictable. It's mechanical. We are mechanical. We can't be aware of ourselves at moments of action or thought. This is our condition. There are certain times when we are acting or thinking, that we cannot be aware of ourselves. 
And because we cannot be aware of ourselves at those times, we cannot choose how we are going to act or think. Agreed? Yes. Now, this is a terrible thing to have to admit to ourselves, that we don't have control over what we do and think, that we are indeed mechanical because we cannot be aware of ourselves at these moments, and during these moments we act and say things that we later, when we do come to ourselves and become aware of ourselves, we then have something called regret, remorse. We look back at it and we say, oh, why couldn't I have kept my big mouth shut? We see the lights behind us in the rearview mirror, the red lights of the cop car. And then we go, oh, why wasn't I paying attention? Why was I speeding? Why didn't I? Uh, so we berate ourselves as if there was something else that we could have done. As if you really had a choice in your mechanical stupor of speeding down the road. And you didn't. But we imagine that we do. And this is one of the first things that has to be given up, sacrificed, this imagination. We don't know ourselves. That's it. I know myself. I've known myself my whole life. That's who I've been my whole life. And I went to school, and my parents were so-and-so and so-and-so, and my brothers and sisters are these people, and, and these are my friends, and these are my relatives, and this is where I grew up, and this is where I live. And So I know myself. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about knowing those things. Those are things about you. But that's not you. Those are things about you. But who are you? We don't know, really. But we imagine that we do. We imagine that we do. We imagine that we would recognize ourselves somewhere. Yet, you'll be walking through a mall or a store somewhere, and you catch a glimpse of yourself in a mirror, and you don't recognize yourself. It takes you a moment to recognize yourself, and then you're shocked by what you see. But we say we know ourselves, but we don't know ourselves. We must study methods of self-study. To even begin to study ourselves, we have to know, first of all, how to study ourselves. But we're so arrogant, we're so full of pride and vanity, that we think, oh, I could do that anytime I wanted to do that. Anytime I wanted to know myself, I could just know myself. But it's not true. It's not true because we don't even know how to approach ourselves. We don't even know how to approach this machine. There was a time when I drove a 1955 Ford. There was a time when I could go and adjust the carburetor and adjust the timing on it and get it running rough, smooth, faster, slower. I can't do that with my car now. I can't even find those things. I look at the, I open the hood and I look down there and I go, what is this thing encased in? I was like, what is this? I can't do that anymore. I would have to study how to learn. I'd have to study methods of how to learn how to work on my car and do those things at this point. I'm not willing to do that now. I've got other things to do. I need to find out how to make this machine work, how to clean this machine and get it running right. I don't have time for that. I pay somebody else for that. Somebody else who has studied a long time and gone to school to learn how to do that, they do that. They have machines and equipment and they can do that. And I'm not interested in learning that. I have something else I need to learn. It's not enough to know that we're not self-conscious, that we are not aware of ourselves. That goes directly back to what I said is, you don't have any control over your thoughts and your body, your actions at certain moments. It's not enough to know that we don't have any control. It's not enough to know that we're not self-conscious. It's not enough to know that we're not aware. We need more than that. We must verify it personally. It's not enough for me to say this to you. It's not enough for people to hear this. Because then they accept it and they go, oh yeah, that's right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah, I believe that. Well, great. So what? Now what? Well, now nothing. Now I can just go on and go, oh, well, I'm more conscious now because I know I'm not conscious. Well, oh, that's success. What has it changed? Can you now do some other action when you're not aware of the action? Can you now say something else when you're not aware of what you're saying? No. But we have the illusion now that we have some control. And this is what we do. This is how we adapt. We take knowledge and we adapt the machine so that we imagine that we're now better. But the fact is, we're no different at all. But when we begin to verify this personally, we start to feel the heat. When you see that you can't control your mouth, that you say things that you regret later, or you say things that you then later have to justify, which is even worse than regret. Self-justification is a disease, and it's a disease that is in epidemic proportions in our species. And there are a lot of other diseases that we have contracted that we don't know that we even have. People had scurvy a couple hundred years ago. They didn't know what scurvy was. All they knew is their teeth started falling out. Their gums were bleeding. Their teeth were falling out. They had all these symptoms. And then someone finally discovered this lack of vitamin C was causing this incredible problem with people's bodies. So they had to get vitamin C into their bodies. We have problems like that as a species, but we don't know we have the problems yet. Or we may know we have the problems, but we don't know how to fix them. This work is about fixing them. Asleep 
We can't know the difference between what's true and what's not true. I told you just the other day, I had this dream about somebody, and she was holding me the tails of cats, felines, five of them, five or six of them. And they were like twitching, it's like she just cut them off, so the tails were still kind of twitching. And in the dream, they were my cats, and I got totally identified, started to scream at her. I couldn't tell the difference between what was true and what was not true, because I was asleep. My heart was pounding, my respiration was... <sighs> I woke up <sighs> in this panic because I was totally identified with something that was not true, because I could not tell the difference between what was true and what was not true, because when I'm asleep, I can't tell the difference. Now, the fact is, we're not aware of ourselves, because we can't control our actions and our thoughts at certain moments. Therefore, we're asleep. So when we're asleep, we can't tell what's true from what's false, what's true from what's not true. Now, this is something you have to personally verify. If you have verified it, well, then your head's probably nodding, and you're smiling and saying, well, it's true, now what? But when we're awake, things are different. We have moments of awareness when things are different. When someone says something to us and instead of the reaction just going mechanically, we can hold our tongue. We can not let our body move in a certain way. We have some control because we know the difference between being awake and being asleep. We're more awake. We may not be awake, but we're more awake than when we're so asleep that we can't stop what we say or do. Things are surrounded by lying. We look at it this world, everything is surrounded by lying. This knowledge will help us to remove some layers of lying. We look at ourselves in the mirror, and the image that we see is surrounded by layers of lying. We don't see what other people see. We see something else, and it's surrounded by layers of lying. That lying takes the form of pictures, pictures that we have taken of ourselves in certain moments when we were glorious and wonderful and full of everything spectacular and very proud of ourselves. And we look through those pictures. So we never see, because those pictures are lies. That was then, this is now. So now, what was then isn't now. If you say it is, what was then is now, it's a lie. And what we do is we filter everything through these lies. So everything in life is surrounded by layers of lying. We're the ones doing the lying, and everyone else is lying as well. And what we do is we all get together in groups. It's like the Liars Club. Liars Club groups. They're Democrats, Republicans, Greenpeaceers, skinheads, Ku Klux Klan, NAACP. And what they, what they all are is just liars clubs who all get together and they agree together. This will be our reality. We'll all agree and believe this. This will be our lie. Great. So now we've ensured that we can't wake up. It's what most religions are. Only when we begin to awaken do we realize the state that we are in now. You must begin to awaken to see where you have been living your life. And this work gives you the opportunity to begin to awaken, to see the condition that we are actually in. You start to strip away the lies, the pictures, the beliefs, and you start to see where you really are. And it can be very depressing. It is very depressing for a lot of people. It's very discouraging for a lot of people. But it's only because they don't know the methods of self-study. If they know the methods of self-study, that depression and discouragement is limited. They may not be able to stop it altogether, but they can limit it and they can stop it from going too far. When we take ourselves as one, we're either completely asleep or very nearly asleep. When we take ourselves as one, I think that, well, I'm this one person. Instead of seeing ourselves as many different eyes, we are nearly asleep. The more awake we are, the more aware we are of how many different voices are in there, how many different wills are in there, pushing and trying to get control striving, jockeying for the telephone, to get hold of the telephone and talk in the master's voice. We're nearer to objective fact when we see each moment as only one eye operating. Notice I say objective fact and not objective truth. We can't even talk about objective truth yet, but we can begin to talk about objective fact because there are some facts concerning these machines, these mechanical bodies that we're living in. And these mechanical bodies are totally attached they are part of, they are actually part of all of life on this planet, which is a film, a thin film on this planet that is organic life, this work teaches. And we are an integral part of that. And we cannot be separated from that. That is, these bodies that we inhabit. But we don't know that we're inhabiting these bodies. You can theoretically or philosophically say, oh yes, I, I know that. No, you don't know that. <laughs> so it's like, you're not inhabiting your car right now. But I guarantee you, if a tree falls on your car right now, you will feel like you were in it. It will have an effect on you. It will impact you. You'll jump up and go running out there. Oh, my 
car, my car, oh God, how am I going to, do you know how much that car cost? Who's going to pay for this? Why did this have to happen to me? The tree fell and crushed my car. Who owns that tree? It's their responsibility to pay me a new car. We, we go all, all to that. Would the insurance company pay for that or are they going to call this an act of God? You're going to get God to pay for it. <laughs> it's exactly where we go. We're so identified with it. That's how it is with this mechanical thing that we are operating. But the problem is, is that we're operating this body, this mechanical body, unconsciously. The same way that you operate your car. How much awareness does it take once you've learned how to drive and you've got a few thousand miles under your belt? How much consciousness does it take to drive your car? Well, it doesn't take hardly any. The proof of that is look at people driving down the road, drinking coffee, reading books, putting on makeup, shaving, talking to somebody, fishing around in the glove compartment. They're not even looking. And they're driving down the road at 60, 65, 75 miles an hour. You've done it. You just want to lie about it. We don't want to think of ourselves that way. We have better pictures of ourselves, much better pictures of ourselves. We're full of pride and vanity when it comes to these things, which keep us from actually seeing the way it is. We cannot be conscious, want to be. If I come up to you and I say, okay, be conscious right now and stay conscious for three minutes. It's hilarious. You laugh in my face because you know. But people who don't know, they would laugh in my face and say, well, I am conscious. So no matter how I cut it, teaching this, I'm going to be laughed at. You're going to laugh because you realize it's true. Or you're going to laugh because you realize that it's not true. That I'm a madman and I don't know what I'm talking about. Or seriously deceived. Whatever. But we can't be conscious when we want to be. The problem is we only realize this after the fact. We only realize after we get the ticket that we weren't conscious. See, Patty only realized after she got the ticket that she'd run a red light. And she looked at it. Diana realized after she got the ticket and got the picture in the mail. They sent her a picture of her driving her car through a red light. And then Diana said, oh, they took a picture of me driving through a red light. <laughs> then, after the fact, she became conscious. But she was not conscious in that moment. Patty was not conscious while she was driving through the red light. But we don't know that. We are convinced that we're conscious all the time. Only later, when we're shown, then we say, okay, well, all right, for that moment I wasn't conscious. But all the rest of the time I was. Okay. So like I said, we can't be conscious when we want to be, and we only realize it after the fact. Consciousness must be studied by comparison. The obstacles to consciousness must be removed by us. The obstacles to your consciousness cannot be removed by me. Wouldn't that be nice? That's what we all want. We all want some master who comes up and touches us right there and removes all the obstacles to consciousness, and we suddenly are awakened. We're like little birds getting in line for that. Feed me. The problem is, you have to remove the obstacles to consciousness in yourself. I cannot do that for you. No one can do that for you. I may be able to point you in the direction and teach you how to do it, but you have to do it. Just like you can teach your child how to eat, they have to do it. And I said consciousness must be studied by comparison. You have to start to see when you are conscious, when you are unconscious. When you are more conscious, when you are less conscious. If you can start to study your consciousness by comparison, then you begin to know the truth. And as you begin to know the truth about yourself, then you're going to want to study the tools, the methods of self-study. But we don't even want to study the methods of self-study until we can prove to ourselves that we're not conscious. So that's the first step, which of course brings us right to self-observation. Self-observation must be practiced while one is conscious. Oh, no. It can't be just practiced mechanically? Well, yes, it can, but it won't do any good. It's not really self-observation. What is it? Imagination. Imagination. So it's dreaming. We dream that we're awake. We dream that we're studying ourselves. We dream that we're comparing this and that. But it's not true, because it has to be done when you're conscious. Well, then what? You have to divide your attention. So you divide your attention between what you are seeing, what you're looking at, and what is looking. In other words, you have to be looking at what is looking to see that it remains conscious while it is looking at what it's studying, what it's observing. That's self-observation. It's not easy. People don't just do that. You have to study and practice it. And if it were easy, everyone would do it all the time. But it's not easy. When I say easy, I mean mechanical. It's not automatic. People don't just know how to do this. It's something that they have to learn and it's something they have to practice. And after a while, you can learn it, you can practice it. As you've already seen to some degree, 
Self-remembering is always directed at yourself. Self-observation is directed at some function of the species body that you are inhabiting. What are the functions of the species body that you're inhabiting? Eating. Eating, yeah. Okay, so that's moving. That's moving center. What about emotional center and thinking center? So thinking, those are actions that this machine does. Feeling, that's something this machine does. This machine feels. This machine thinks. But we don't have any control over what it thinks and what it feels. But we imagine that we do. So it's clear. This is our condition. I don't think it was this clear November 5th, 2003. But we hadn't tried to sit through Pashana meditation. That's part of it. But I suspect that had I given this very same talk November 5th, 2004, November 5th, 2005, you would have understood it better and you hadn't sat through it then either. Self-remembering is the feeling of I, your own person. We can't remember ourselves now because we never knew ourselves. We have to know ourselves a little bit before we can remember ourselves. But the feeling of I right now, where that is, is in this machine that we're inhabiting. But we don't think we're inhabiting this machine. We think we are this machine. Take this machine away and we think we've taken us away. And the truth is, for many people, take the machine away and you have taken them away because they have nothing else. Or they can't put their sense of I in something else. We've talked before about the different bodies of man, the physical body, the emotional body. The emotional body is also called the astral body. We talked about this? Yes, we've talked about this, okay. Our astral bodies are war-torn because from an early age, we are wounded emotionally over and over again by the people in our lives. And each of those wounds leaves a scar. The more intense that wound, the deeper that scar, the worse that scar. Because we're sheep, we have this habit of ruminating. And what ruminating is, is it's going back and bringing up again that very thing that caused the emotional scar and chewing the cud, going through the whole thing again and again. We do that so many times until that scar is then chiseled in stone, deep, deep, deep. At first, it may be just a scar that's just a line in the sand and the wind will come and time will come and the tide will come and just wash that away. But when we ruminate, it's like taking a stick and drawing that line deeper. We ruminate again and take the stick and draw it deeper. We ruminate again, take the stick and draw it deeper. And then finally, what we end up doing is getting out a chisel and a hammer and chiseling that line into stone. These are called sankaras, and the sankaras exist in your astral body, in and on your astral body which is fragmented. And it's fragmented because you cut and chop and hack that thing so much that it ends up in pieces. It's dysfunctional. So where we are right now is these dysfunctional beings. We can't function emotionally because we're so scarred, we're so wounded. We need to somehow get this healed. We're in the process of doing it, and the passion and meditation is part of that. Self-remembering is not what we're talking about. Well, we're talking about that, but we can't really do it. The feeling of I, your own person. Through self-observation, we realized we do not remember ourselves. We begin to observe ourselves, and then we realize we don't remember ourselves. If we did remember ourselves, then we wouldn't say the things we say and do the things we do. Because we would be remembering ourselves, we would be remembering ourselves, and we wouldn't have to be identified with this mechanical thing that is always saying and doing the stuff that whatever it's attached to, it's reacting, jerking around, doing whatever it's doing, because it is controlled by this huge film of organic life on this planet and whatever is acting on it. And what is acting on it? Well, everything. The sun is acting on it. Well, how do I know that? Well, look at organic life on this planet. Look at the trees. The wind is blowing the leaves and the trees around. The sun is making them warm and grow. And they're photosynthesized because of it. The earth is nurturing them. The water is nurturing them. The sun is nurturing them. So they are at the effect of those elements, aren't they? We are part of that. We're at the effect of those elements. The wind, the water, the sun, the earth all affect us. They all have an effect on us. You take the sun away from man and he will die. This physical body will die. The species cannot exist without the sun. The species cannot exist without water. The species cannot exist without air. The species cannot exist without the earth because from the earth comes our sustenance for this mechanical body, for this species body. It cannot exist without that. So we are totally, completely part of the film of organic life on this planet as a species body. And as long as we think that we're this species body, this animalistic body, we are not in control. Something else is controlling us. We want to develop fully, complete ourselves. Then we need to know how to do that. We need to know how to stop being identified with this species body how to stop the emotional wounds and scars from occurring on the emotional body.
We don't know how to do that, but we're learning. Do what you can. Either observe at the moment or remember it later. And that's all we can do right now. We can either observe at the moment what's going on or we'll remember it later. But if you can remember it later, that's good. If you can observe at the moment, that's better. But we can't do that. We've already established we can't do that. We've already established that at certain moments, we can't control our thoughts and we can't control our bodies, our actions. We've already established that at certain moments, we cannot wake up when we want to wake up. We cannot be awake when we want to be awake. As a matter of fact, the only way that we ever knew that we were asleep is when we wake up. Some conscious shock will wake us up and we realize we've been asleep. But we have no idea how long. Could have been for hours, could have been for minutes, could have been for days, could have been for years. There are people who sleep for lifetimes. They wake up in some other lifetime. That may be too much right now. We can change. If we can be more conscious, this will make higher centers active. Higher centers are really already active. But what that means is it will make them active in influencing us. We will put ourselves in a place where we can be acted on or influenced by higher centers. At the moment, we are acted on and influenced by higher centers, just in the same way that when you're lying on your bed, <laughs> snoring, you are being acted on by oxygen, the air you're breathing. When you're asleep, you don't know that, but you're being acted on. So it's influencing. Now, when you're awake, you can determine how you're going to breathe. You have the ability to do that, yes? You can determine whether you're going to take a deep breath now, hold your breath, take short breaths. You have some control on that when you're awake. When you're asleep, you don't. But we can change. Self-awareness is the greatest change possible to us. So the greatest change that we can make is we can become aware of ourselves, which is huge change. It doesn't look like much. Well, that doesn't seem like much. So yeah, try it. When you try it, you realize you can't wake up when you want to wake up. You can't stop saying what you don't want to say. You can't stop doing what you don't want to do. You can't say what you want to say, and you can't do what you want to do because you can't wake up long enough to be in control of it. And self-awareness, self-consciousness becomes a big deal. Realizing that you don't remember yourself, in a sense, is self-remembering. Because you're beginning to see that there is something other than what you think you are. Because when you're not remembering yourself, you're identifying with this other thing, this mechanical thing, this species body. You're identifying with this, and when you're identified with it, this is what you think you are. If the realization that we don't remember ourselves becomes constant, then we can remember ourselves. If we begin to realize, I don't remember myself, we can start to remember that all the time, then we're remembering ourselves. So just the simple fact of remembering that we don't remember ourselves is the first step to remembering ourselves. We must be able to feel when we're identified. You've got to be able to feel when you're identified. But that's not enough. Then you've got to stop it. That's a lot more difficult. But it's very difficult in the beginning to even know when you're identified. How long has it taken you? It's taken you years of practice and study. Because now you'll say to me, I'm totally identified. I can't see it because I'm just totally identified. The next step is learn how to stop it. So I'm totally identified. Okay, stop it. And that's what I'll say to you. You just said to me the other day, I'm, well, I'm identified. I said, well, stop it. Well, I will later. Well, why won't you stop it now? And I'll tell you why. Because you're justifying it. You stop justifying it and you'll stop identifying with it. But remember that sickness, self-justification, it's automatic. It's a mechanical response for us. That will be self-remembering. Feel when you're identified and stop it. Why would you stop it? Well, you'd have to remember yourself to stop it. You'd have to remember yourself and what you're doing here and why you're in the work and what your aim is. So you'd be remembering yourself, wouldn't you? You see that remembering yourself is really a higher state of consciousness. All it is is just a higher state of consciousness. It's what naturally occurs in a higher state of consciousness. When your level of being is increased, self-remembering is what naturally occurs. It's what happens. Real self-remembering requires emotion. Right now we work in the dark. We work by feel. We have to grope around in the dark. But when we have emotion, when we start to heal emotionally and we have emotion, we can connect up with a higher emotional center, then we begin to work in a totally different way. You must be able to see when you were wrong and control your thoughts. This is so difficult because we're never wrong. Because of the disease of self-justification, we're never wrong, ever. After the fact, we can see that we were wrong. Maybe if we've been working. But when we're being wrong, it's very difficult to see that we're wrong. We've got to learn how to see when we're wrong and control it. Stop it. Control our thoughts at that time. Why control our thoughts at that time? Yes? Because that's the only thing that we can actually do is direct. That's right, because that's where we begin. Control your thoughts. You see you're wrong. Okay, I'm wrong. If you can't control your thoughts at that moment, your thoughts will start to justify, and then you won't see you're wrong anymore. It'll cover it right up. So you've got to be able to control your thoughts at that moment. Emotional shocks make you realize, I am. You get emotional shocks, and I don't mean scars. I don't mean those kinds of wounds. I mean real emotional shocks. When you have a moment of awareness, of real emotional awareness, 
that you are not this species body, not this mechanical apparatus that's connected to this whole film of organic life on this planet being pushed and swayed and moved and changed and directed completely by that. We don't even like to think like that. It's so offensive to even think that we are like that. No, I'm not like that, but that's good later. In the beginning, it's death because it stops people. But later, it is our connecting link to the higher centers. Because the higher centers are calling us, real eye is calling us, real eye is beckoning to us, trying to get us to come home, trying to get us to come out of this game that we're playing, trying to get us to come out of the machine, get out of the car, get out of the car. You know, the car's going over a cliff, get out of the car. No, it's my car! It's just that way. It's like, you remember I used to tell the story about mixed emotions? It's like watching your mother-in-law go over a cliff in your brand new Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> you just don't know how to behave about that. The thing is, is that when we're identified with our brand new Mercedes Benz that just got in a wreck, whether we're identified because we just bought it and we're out there driving around and going, hey, look at this, and we're going to visit all our friends and taking them for a ride and, and then driving slow by windows, you know, so we can see our reflection and stuff like that. You know, we're identified with that side of it, but we're just as identified when we're in a wreck. Oh my God, my car, look at my car, what did you do to my car? Ah! That car has gone over a cliff. There are a lot of people who won't get out of the car. They just ride it right down. What I'm saying is, get out of the vehicle. It's going over a cliff, get out of it. What does that mean? Get out of my body? No. I'm saying, start to see your body as what it actually is. It's your connection to the film of organic life on this planet, but it's not you, and you can't control it. Oh yes, I can. Look, I can raise my hand. Look, I can put my hand down. Yeah, have a stroke and tell me that. Oh, well, that's different. Yeah, It's always different when I'm talking about the truth. When you're talking about your illusion, it's always the same. You're always in control. You always know. You always can handle it. You're always awake. But then your life doesn't show that. Well, then what are you doing here and why are you listening to me? You have to say, because I can't control myself, because I can't do what you're saying, and because I have some hope that you can teach me to do it. That may not be very pleasant to your pride and vanity, but you have to make a decision here. What are you going to do? You're going to let your pride and vanity run the rest of your life? You're going to let it pick you up and walk you out of here like it's done so many other people? Or are you going to say, well, look, it means me no good. My pride and vanity means me no good. It's never done anything to help me to wake up and have a better life. It's never helped me to free myself from the miseries that I keep on creating. In fact, it doubles them and triples them and quadruples them. You've got to ask yourself, what are you going to do? And then you've got to do it. And that's what we're talking about.